And good evening and welcome. I am Dr. Jeffrey Sterling, the Surgeon General for Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. On behalf of our General President, Brother Dr. Willis Lonson III, it's a pleasure to invite you to this conversation, which is about dental health and dental hygiene. I'm very pleased to be bringing this conversation to us because although so many of us think about the beauty of our smiles, we don't often think in terms of the mouth being the gateway to the rest of the body. And as you will learn this evening, there's a lot of health and disease that occurs depending on how you take care of your mouth. So let's get into that conversation. It's a pleasure for me to be introducing um, tonight's moderator, Deputy General uh, Langston Smith. Uh, this man is simply incredible. I'm so proud to call him my brother. In fact, he has been Alpha Phi Alpha's brother of the year. Um, is it five different times, I believe? Over four different decades. That means that something, like that, something like that. Uh, the Hall of Fame credentials, to be sure. And you've actually been chapter president five different times as well across the country, if I remember correctly. So amongst other things, I mean, you've just had such a decorated um, career, including um, a chairmanship in the Department of Endodontics at Howard University. And, and there's just so much more about which I could brag, but it's just an honor to have you here as part of the Surgeon General Initiative and our Deputy Director for Dental Health. So without further ado, I will wish you a great program and, and take it away and introduce uh, tonight's distinguished panel. Thank you, Brother Sterling, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. As Brother Sterling mentioned, I am first want to say good evening. I am Brother Langston Smith, Deputy Surgeon General for Dental Health. On behalf of our Joint President, Brother Lanzer, the Board, and the Surgeon General, I welcome you to tonight's webinar. Our topic tonight, the relationship between oral health and systemic health. All too often, oral health is considered last in the hierarchy of health care. We often fail to consider that our Oral health is very important and is closely related to our total health. Did you know that the health of your teeth and gums often provide clues to your overall health and that problems in your mouth can lead to problems elsewhere in the body? Our distinguished panel will discuss these things with you tonight. But first, please ensure that your devices are muted. And secondly, we will have a question and answer period after the presentation. So please place your, place your questions in the comment space and we will try to get them, get to them all. After all, we want you to be better informed after tonight's session. Our panel tonight is very distinguished and acclaimed dental professionals with outstanding backgrounds in clinical and academic dentistry. I will introduce them to you alphabetically. Dr. Roosevelt Allen. Brother Allen is Vice President and Dental Director of the Government Business Unit, United Concordia Dental. Dr. Allen is a major, is a retired Major General of the United States Air Force. He served as the Medical Operations and Research Director and Chief of the Air Force Dental Corps. Brother Allen is a graduate of Howard University's College of Dentistry. We have Brother Dr. J. Anderson. Brother Anderson is Dental Director for the One Community Health Federally Qualified Health Center in Sacramento, California. Dr. Anderson served as Chief Dental Officer of HRSA's Division of Community and Migrant Health. J. graduated from the University of Kentucky College of Dentistry and received the Master of Health Services Administration and the Master of Public Health from the University of Michigan School of, Dennis, a School of Public Health. Next, we have Brother Ryle Bell. Dr. Bell is Professor Emeritus at the College of Dentistry at Howard University. Brother Bell is also a graduate of Howard University College of Dentistry and received his training in his specialty training in prosthodontics from Ohio State University. Brother Bell was a member of the Removable Prosthodontics Faculty at Howard and served also as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and the Associate Dean for Clinical Affairs. His tenure at Howard lasted over 40 years. Our next panelist is Brother Reginald Salter. Brother Salter is currently an Assistant Professor of Restorative Dentistry at Howard University, where he serves as Director for Student Activities. 
Brother Salter is also a graduate of Howard University. He completed the advanced education and dental, general dentistry residency while serving the United States Navy and also served with the National Health Service. Next, we have Ms. Tamana Springer. Ms. Springer is a third year dental student at Howard University. She is a registered dental hygienist having completed her dental hygiene training at Howard University. And as you can see, we have heavy Howard University flavor tonight. Welcome panelist. We will begin our discussion this evening on just what is oral health with Brother Bell. And we will then move into the relationship between oral health and systemic health with Brother Allen, followed by the benefits of oral health by Brother Anderson, and then a discussion on the mechanics of oral health uh, by Brother Salter. And we'll wrap up the evening with a demonstration of proper brushing and flossing techniques with Spinger. So here's for an evening of information on how you can keep your smile beautiful. And to start us off, Brother Rao Bell. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of this very distinguished panel of individuals, and I feel honored to be a part of it. Uh, at this point, you know, having retired from Howard University for um, over 10 years now, I, I find myself as those are the, the old hats, as they call us, who get, get assigned to the uh, boondocks and caught up on occasion. And so I enjoy having been involved in this, this uh, experience this evening. In terms of talking about oral health, uh, what do dentists really mean when they talk about oral health? Basically, we are talking about the condition where the mouth is free from pain, facial pain, diseases, and any type of disorders that limit your ability to bite, to chew, to smile, to speak, and that may affect your psychosocial well-being. So those are the basic things we're talking about when we say about oral health. I want to remind you the oral environment begins with the lips, the outside of the lips actually, and extends back into the mouth we're to the throat area, we're in the back, there's a piece of tissue hanging then called, we call the uvula, which leads you into the pharynx, and it goes all the way back there. And unlike what most people seem to think, the oral environment involves more than just teeth. In there you find a tongue, ch uh, cheeks, uh, salivary glands and ducts, taste buds, oral musculature, blood vessels and nerves, a whole lot of things, structures in there that dentists deal with uh, every day. And so drill, fill and build is not all that we do. Teeth are only a one entity in the oral environment. I always tell patients that it may be an obvious statement when you think about it, but I always like to say it anyway. The mouth is a part of the body. For some reason, lots of people think the mouth is just there and it's somehow not connected to the rest of the body. But it is a part of the body. And you will find the same diseases that affect the body elsewhere also affect the mouth, from simple infections all the way to cancer. So everything you find in the rest of the body, you could very well find in the mouth. It's very important to remember that there are many systemic diseases that show up in the mouth because the mouth is the gateway to the body. And it plays a very important role in the maintenance of oral health and sometimes in the diagnosis of systemic diseases. Quite often, you may see something in the mouth that tells you there's something else going on in another part of the body. And so it's important to understand the relationship then between oral health and the health of the rest of the body. Dennis, I was saying that if you ignore your teeth, they will go away. But I'm saying if you ignore your mouth, the consequences may very well be life-threatening. And so it's very important that you not only think of teeth when you're thinking of the mouth, but all of the structures that you have within the oral cavity. Now, having discussed this definition of oral health, I want to then pass it on to my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Roosevelt Allen, who will then talk about the connection between oral health and systemic health. Roosevelt, on to you. Uh, thank you so much, Brother Bell. I'm going to share my screen here.
Are you able to see my slides okay? So I'm going to take the opportunity. I want to take the opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Bell, for um, that introduction. And let me also take the opportunity to say I'm truly honored to be part of this distinguished group as well. Uh, Dr. Bell or Brother Bell spoke to you about just what oral health is. I want to take the few, next few moments and talk to you a little bit about the relationship that exists between oral health and systemic health. Uh, it's important to remember when I say systemic health, in essence, I think the most important thing you want to remember is that your overall oral health or your overall total health can be impacted by your oral health. And as we talk about that, I think it's important that, you, that we talk a little bit about some of the statistics. Many times when we say systemic health, we're also talking about some of the chronic diseases that exist um, with a number of people. Just a few statistics. There's a data that shows roughly 60% of adults have at, one, at least one chronic disease. That data also shows that roughly 40% of adults have at least two chronic diseases. Now, when I talk about chronic diseases, I'm talking about those diseases that people have had for a long period of time, and it generally takes some type of medication or some type of maintenance as far as to control that disease. Some of the examples of chronic diseases that I'm talking about include things like heart disease, stroke, um, diabetes, uh, chronic kidney disease, chronic respiratory disease like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema, um, bronchitis. I'm also talking about some of the cancers as well as Alzheimer's. And in fact, all of those diseases that I just finished talking about they cost about $3.7 trillion per year in healthcare cost. While there's a significant cost associated with that, there's also a number of days that are lost from work as a result of people missing um, work. But I think it's also important now that I've talked about systemic diseases to talk about all diseases. And there are studies that show roughly 75% of adults have some type of gum disease. Now that gum disease can be pretty minor, such as gingivitis, but it can also be very major like periodontitis. And when people develop these diseases, what we found is that the bacteria and the inflammation associated with many of these gum diseases, that they can have an impact on your overall health by having an impact on a number of these diseases. As Brother Bell indicated, you know, coming in for an examination and being seen, and because so many of these diseases are manifested in the oral cavity, that you can first sort of address these diseases initially uh, by just seeing your dentist. So the importance of a dental exam is extremely important. What we see in this photo, in this slide, is what is first a normal tooth on the left-hand side, but on the right side, you'll see periodontitis. And with periodontitis, there's a loss of bone, but there's also that inflammation and that bacteria that I spoke to you about a little bit earlier. And with that inflammation and that bacteria, it gets into the bloodstream it has an impact on a number of systemic diseases or chronic diseases. Studies are showing that heart diseases and diabetes, that those are all impacted by this bacteria. And the, the actual mechanism as to how it happens is not truly understood. But if you look at heart disease, the belief is that there's an increase in a certain, um, what's called C-reactant protein, and that has an increase in strokes as well as uh, heart diseases, uh, uh, for members. And when it comes to diabetes, there are studies that show that that bacteria or that inflammation can have an impact on the white blood cells. And those white blood cells are the ones that fight infections. And so again, studies have continued to show that all of these chronic diseases and disorders that you see on the right-hand side, like hypertension, osteopor uh, osteoporosis, anxiety, glaucoma, even with females who are having children, what we're seeing is that the inflammation and the bacteria has an impact, not only the length of term that the member, I mean, that the uh, mother is able to take the child to, uh, before it's born, but also the birth weight of that child is also impacted by the inflammation and the bacteria that exist. I think what's even, while this is disturbing, what is even more disturbing is that there are two things I wanna focus on. Many of these chronic diseases and disorders, 
we see a significant disparity among brown and black people. So I talked about those diseases like hypertension and diabetes and stroke. Well, if you look at this data, you will see that African-Americans are developing these diseases at a higher percentage in comparison to, their, uh, to white um, individuals. You will also see that African-Americans are dying at an earlier age from a number of these diseases as well. And then if you look on the right-hand side, as I mentioned, the disparities associated with these diseases are significantly higher in African-American than brown, brown people. So if you look at um, the increase or the prevalence of um, diabetes, uh, one in six adults have diabetes when it comes to African-Americans. But if you look at the Caucasians, it's only one in 10. If you look at uncontrolled diabetes, you will also see it is a significantly higher percentage for Latinos as well as for African-Americans. And as we look at our children, the same thing. We're seeing higher incidences of type 2 diabetes in our young um, black and brown uh, individuals. And so while that's disturbing, the other thing that is disturbing is that we continue to see this not only with those chronic diseases, but also with Alzheimer's. If you look at Alzheimer's, you will see that this data shows that older African-Americans are about twice as likely to have Alzheimer's and other dementia as white members. And then you can see on the right-hand side that the individuals who lead when it comes to lung cancer are African-Americans. And so while we have all of these disparities, and we know that if you go to the dentist, you may be able to identify these, what we also see is the second disturbing point I wanted to make is that the dental utilization is much lower for Hispanics and for Blacks. If you look at children, or if you look at adults, or if you even look at seniors, you will see that in comparison to their uh, to Asians as well as whites, that African Americans are generally on the lower end when it comes to seeing a dentist, which is very important to not only diagnose some of these uh, diseases, but also to control the inflammation and the bacteria that exist as a result of that. And so if we really want to improve the outcomes of, uh, of our health, it's important that we get in to see the dentist. Just as we go in to see our physicians about diabetes and cardiovascular disease, and that's sort of checked on a regular basis, it's also important that we go in and that we see our dentist in order to um, to control the bacteria and inflammation that has a significant impact on many of these chronic diseases. I am going to now pass things on to Dr. Anderson, who's going to talk about um, some of the benefits of oral health. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, screen in a few minutes. Well, I'm trying. Feedback. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's my sincere pleasure to be here to talk about my favorite subject in the world, the benefits of oral health. Um, as Brother Smith mentioned, um, he um, that I worked in the federal government in the Department of Health and Human Services uh, for quite a long time. And then I became the chief dental officer for uh, the agency that provides funding for care uh, across the nation. Um, and I ended up, in, I'm ending up my career working in a community health center uh, where, where I started. Uh, what uh, Brother Smith didn't say is that um, he is the one that got me interested in Alpha. Um, he asked me, would I be interested in learning more? And um, has been a mentor ever since. Um, when you think about oral health, you have to think that, let me, my, okay. From the very first moment that you take your first breath, it is probably through your mouth. And the very last moment you, in, when you live your life 
you still take that same breath through your mouth. To me, the mouth has to be the most important organ because it connects you with everything just about in your life. If you think about it, you think about the nourishment, the food that you eat, um, the songs that you sing, the words you speak to your friends, it all comes through your mouth. Um, having worked in, the, in, in government, um, I worked um, with a group of folks who created the um, Surgeon General's Report on Oral Health and under the leadership of Dr. David Satcher. Now, Dr. Satcher said we tended not to see oral health as part of overall health. Uh, too often is viewed as teeth and gums and nothing else. Um, the report um, released in the year 2000 by the Surgeon General uh, noted that um, Americans have less access to oral health than all most than all healthcare um, issues um, that are available, meaning that people are less likely to see their dentist to see oral health prof professionals than they are to see other medical providers. Um, another Surgeon General said, "You're not healthy." without good oral health. Key oral health outcomes related to disparities include dental caries, periodontal disease, and oral cancer. Oral cancer in African American communities is experienced about the same amount as it is in other um, ethnic groups. However, uh, because we tend not to go to the dentist, we tend not to get the examinations we need, more black men die of oral cancer than any other group. And that is because of delayed diagnosis. The point here is that if we want to be helpful, we have to engage with those who can help us. There are a lot of reasons why people, our brothers, our sisters, do not go to the dentist. A lot of times it is the fear of dentistry, but a lot of, most of the time it's because they don't view it as being accessible or affordable. This is part of the story that we see too often when we look at the determinants of health and the determinants of our, our lifestyles and um, how we live our life. You know, things like the living wage, clean drinking water, housing security, uh, they all contribute to medical determinants of chronic disease such as diabetes, periodontal disease, hypertension, um, especially among people of color. And this was noted by our most recent Surgeon General, uh, Jerome Adams. Having good oral hygiene leads to better uh, total body health and will help you avoid problems like diabetes, heart disease, and dementia. Studies have shown that the bacteria that cause gum disease are also found with patients who have heart disease, lung disease, including pneumonia. If the gums are infected with bacteria, it can make way into the bloodstream and have an opportunity to have an impact on the health of your heart and could cause a stroke. Any gum disease can make it harder to control your blood glucose or in diabetes. Oftentimes, we look at gum disease as a separate um, entity than 
any other disease that will uh, that results in an infection in your body. Theoretically, if you look at periodontal disease as an infection on any other part of the body, the infection in your gum could be as, as big as your whole hand being infected in terms of surface area. But we discount that often, and we don't include that when we look at the need for medical care. Oftentimes, we will take out a tooth that has periodontal disease can, and then not think that much about it. Uh, recently, a friend of mine who had diabetes had his foot amputated, um, and it was a significant impact on his life. What I'm trying to say is that we're not in a contest around who is the sickest or what gets sicker. Um, it is a disease of the body that needs to be managed at all times during life. When we look at oral health um, and the risk, well, and risk factors that are related to it, um, we can look at um, decreased experience in cancer, especially oral cancer. A lot of times uh, when we look in the mouth, we're looking for um, lesions, we're looking for bumps that shouldn't be there. Um, people, when they look in the mirror and look in their mouth, they're probably not aware that, say you have a, um, a little bump in the mouth, it doesn't hurt, and you don't pay much attention to it. But I've seen in my practice, when I look in and do an exam, that little, bump, that little bump could be the precursor to oral cancer and should be biopsied. And we should take a look at it uh, from the perspective of if it is something that is serious, we can intervene quite early. We want to look at oral health as it relates to our overall life cycle. Women who have, um, who, when they are pregnant and have toothaches and they have swollen gums, um, studies have shown that the birth outcome for women, um, the babies, is diminished. Um, there are more complications during pregnancy and um, the birth weight of the baby is less when women have um, tooth decay and or periodontal disease. Um, the dangers of oral health doesn't stop with um, pregnancy or con a conception. Studies have shown that women who have poor oral health are likely to spread the ability to have dental caries to their kids so that kids at a very young age will experience dental, dental caries, which will have an impact on their over, over the over the whole life cycle that of these children. Studies have shown that dental decay is an infectious transmissible transmissible disease that is often transferred from the caregiver to the infant. Um, periodontal disease even though it is an infectious disease, it's less likely to be contagious. However, um, the bacteria that cause the inflammatory reaction can spread through saliva. Working in the public health service, our first 
job is to spread the word of prevention. The use of dental fluoride, use of fluoride in, in the drinking water is probably the biggest public health uh, success story in our nation. Um, and it's estimated that 51 million school hours and 160 4 million work hours are lost each year to dental related illnesses. Community water fluoridation is so effective in preventing tooth decay that the CDC and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has named it the, one of the 10 great public health achievements of the 20, 20th century. Like vaccines, fluoride helps people um, in a passive kind of way. All you have to do is drink the water um, and you have a benefit. Even if you don't drink water from the tap, the water that you use to cook, the water that's in your environment, if you drink it, if you eat it, you will have exposure to fluoride, which has been proven to be safe and effective. When we look at fluoride again, it is also has an in, a economic impact on our health. The, over the average lifetime, we, if we live in a fluoridated community, fluoridation will reduce your overall health or dental costs to about what you would pay for a filling. In most, in most cities, for every $1 invested in water fluoridation, $38 in, uh, it reduces $38 in dental treatment costs. People worry about fluoride being some kind of um, chemical, um, chemical event that, you know, they want to push. But in, in truth, fluoride occurs naturally in the drinking water. It's in the ocean. Um, it is one of the, one of the, it, one of the um, chemicals in life that um, is very prevalent. The safety of fluoride does mean it needs to be monitored in communities and it will need to um, you need to be aware of how much fluoride you're taking my my recommendation is always use toothpaste with fluoride fluoride in it look into your mouth can give your healthcare provider a snapshot of your over, overall health Oral health is vital to general health and well-being at every stage of life. A healthy mouth enables not only nutrition of the physical body, but it enhances the social interaction and promotes self-esteem and feelings of well-being. I tell my patients that you need to brush at least twice a day and floss all the teeth you want to keep. Thank you very much. We now move to Dr. Salter on the mechanics of oral health. Dr. Salter. Thank you, Brother Smith. Uh, good evening, everyone. Allow me a few moments to share my screen, if you will.
Okay, hopefully everyone can see my screen. So I get the privilege tonight of, of joining my good brothers and uh, one of my um, wonderful students here tonight uh, for a panel that is much needed. I was engaged in reading some of the comments in the chat. Good to see some brothers I haven't seen or spoken to in a while. And I saw one brother wrote that we need to take the lead in healthcare. And indeed, I, I certainly agree with that. Um, you've already heard it tonight, and I agree that the mouth is the portal to the body. And so total health care oftentimes began with, uh, with the mouth, and, and that is where our role as health care practitioners become important. I'm talking tonight about what I call uh, oral health 101, uh, something that we engage in on a daily basis, which is the brushing of our teeth. Um, and let's look at a couple of mechanical considerations. Here's the first thing. A lot of people do not realize that a soft bristle brush is highly recommended. Uh, most people, I, I hear patients say that they like the hard bristles because they feel as if they are accomplishing their goal. Um, but indeed, you will find as we talk a little bit more tonight that it is the soft bristle that will get the job done for anything that you really can do at home. A hard bristle is very abrasive, and we'll talk about some of the effects of using a hard bristle. Electric versus manual. This is often a common question patients will have. There really is no uh, rule of thumb for either. Uh, again, stick with rule number one, which is the bristles should be soft. For people who have manual dexterity problems, uh, arthritis or such, uh, the electric toothbrush is very much beneficial. Some people simply like the electric toothbrush because it gives you that satisfaction or that feeling of satisfaction of being clean. That is perfectly fine. Uh, it is all in a technique that is important for what you want to accomplish. On the, in the picture to my left, uh, this is something that everyone should be remain cognizant of. It is the wearing away of your bristles. It is not uncommon for many of us to keep our toothbrushes for six months until we visit our dentist or sometimes even 12 months or more. I highly recommend to my patients that you change your brush every month. Keep in mind what the role of the toothbrush is. So it sometimes becomes um, a thankless thing to just move about your day, start your day with, with uh, working out or what have you and then brushing. But you really must remain cognizant of when your toothbrush has done what it is intended to do. Uh, keep in mind the bacterial content and buildup. So I do recommend changing your brush on a monthly basis. Orthodontics is becoming even more popular than ever now. A lot of patients have um, appliances, braces, and uh, especially with my teenage patients, they always proclaim that they're not able to always brush and clean properly. This is a, a small device that you can purchase in the toothbrush section of the um, grocery store or in your pharmacy. It's called a Proxy Brush. Um, not only is it good for cleaning around your orthodontic braces, it is also very, very good for cleaning in between the teeth. Very inexpensive, but very um, effective in what you are trying to accomplish. So why the soft bristle? Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about gum disease. Most of you have heard of the term gingivitis. So in the picture to your left there, this is an image that shows a mild case of gingivitis, where your, your gums are um, inflamed or red around the border. One of the first signs that you will see at home, most people, is uh, bleeding of the gingiva. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of ironic, but a lot of patients will say, I don't floss because I bleed. Well, it should be quite the opposite. If you are bleeding, you actually should be flossing more because the picture in the middle is what you're trying to achieve. Now, if you look at the picture to your right and you follow the arrows, um, this may not be uh, uh, easily recognizable for someone who's not in the healthcare or dental field, but in this patient or in this person, you will see that the gum lines are receding. In fact, I can see in this patient part of the patient um, root of those two teeth there. That is one of the effects of using a hard bristle, uh, bristle brush, as well as one of the effects of brushing too hard. Because your gums are it's tissue, so if you're not massaging your gums with your brush, you're being overly aggressive, then your tissue will react by moving away. 
moving away from that causative agent or, or force that is causing harm to it. What is the proper technique? A 45 degree angle, of course, no one expects any of you or anyone to um, get inside of your mouth and measure. But the ideal is to angle the bristles towards your gums, towards your gingiva. And you want to use a circular motion. Again, think about it as a massage. You're massaging your tissue or your gums. Uh, you don't want to be overly aggressive. Don't forget to brush your tongue. A lot of bacteria will harbor right there on your tongue. In fact, if you start your morning by brushing your tongue before your teeth, you will notice an instantaneous taste in your breath because a lot of the bacteria buildup is right there in your tongue. And then, of course, on the picture of the on the left, this is something that we often see. This happens when uh, patients or people tend to forget the backside or what we call the lingual surface of your teeth. And then you get that buildup on the back of your teeth. And of course, we can see that because we're in your mouth, you know, either directly or with the mirror. It's most common on um, the bottom teeth because your tongue is there. So when you have that buildup on the back of your teeth, your tongue, in a sense, make all of that plaque build up very smooth because your tongue is constantly rubbing there. So it becomes, in your mind, a part of your body, a part of your um, teeth. I've had patients where we've removed the plaque or the calculus build up on the back of their teeth. And because the bacteria has eaten away at their gingiva or gums, there is now space there. And they can actually feel that space with their tongue. Well, in the patient's mind, sometimes they feel that the dentist has caused harm. But in fact, they actually felt as if that bacteria buildup was a part of the tooth because uh, it has been there for a, quite a bit of long time there. Being overly aggressive. Keep in mind, brushing your teeth is like a massage, okay? 45 degrees in a circular motion, bristles angled towards the gingiva. It should be like a massage. So you shouldn't be trying to dig for gold there because it's not going to come out. You want to keep that touch very light and also, if you are going to use an electro, uh, electric toothbrush, you really do not need to move your hand at all, other than to position the bristles in the correct spot. A lot of patients will use the electric toothbrush, which is already rotating, but at the same time, they will use the circular motion with their hand. That's too aggressive. So what happens if you are overly aggressive? If you have that hard bristle, if you're using uh, an excessive amount, a lot of patients like to use uh, baking soda at home to get the whiteness. Again, you can cause recession of your gingiva or your gums. And when that happens, you can't enjoy a good cup of coffee because sometimes you're sensitive to hot. You can't enjoy a good um, bottle of cold water because you're sensitive. You can't enjoy ice cream because you're sensitive. And so, you know, the, the, a lot of patients instantaneously think that they have cavities when there's sensitivity there. But most of the times, well, a lot of times is caused by um, some trauma that we have done with our brushing. So what's the difference? I wanted to go over these terms with you so that as you visit with your dental provider, that you will have a leg up on some of the terminology that you may hear. We hear tartar a lot. Tartar is a discoloration. Now you can get tartar from food that have um, a high concentration of dyes. Uh, most often you will get tartar from cigarettes, coffee. Uh, I love Coca-Cola, I admit, uh, Pepsi. Anything with those uh, flavoring in there can lead to a tartar buildup. Plaque, you hear that often. What plaque means is a buildup of bacteria on the tooth or the teeth that's soft. This is what you can remove with your brushing and your flossing. So if you look at the second picture here, you will see you will see that yellowish type of filling material there. Um, when we were younger, we used to call it um, cheese. You have cheese on your teeth. That's what plaque is. It can be removed. And that is why you want to brush after each meal or no less than twice a day. You want to floss daily because you want to remove those soft deposits while you can. If those deposits stay there for a while, they, be, they harden. And so you get picture number three and picture number four. And once the plaque hardens, it is now called calculus. And this is when you will see your hygienist or your dentist. And that is when uh, we pull out those 
shining material. We call them scalers, and a lot of patients say they frighten them when they see them on the table. But that is what we will use because calculus is quite tenacious. It will hang on to your tooth until it is mechanically removed. And this is something often that patients cannot do completely at home, so it must be done um, with your dental provider. And in the bottom picture, you see a very aggressive case of calculus buildup. And once that calculus makes its way under your gums, under your gingiva, it can start to eat away at your periodontal tissue. And this is what we call periodontal disease, and there are stages. Once that happens, then you start to lose the ligaments or the attachment of your gums to your tooth or your teeth. You also start to lose the bone around your teeth. When I was younger, growing up in South Georgia, it was not uncommon to see elderly people without teeth. So growing up, I thought that was natural. When you become older, you lose your, your um, teeth. Well, this is really what is going on here. And this is why it is important that we really understand these stages. Uh, as my brother talked about earlier, some of the systemic things that we encounter uh, as a population uh, escalator even started by poor oral health care. So this is what is happening when you see your dentist or your dental hygienist, again, the scalers, removing that tenacious material from um, your teeth. And that is called scaling. It is scaling when that buildup is above your gingiva or above your gum line. Once we have to go below your gum line, that is when you will have to be anesthetized. And most patients are, you know, doing what they can to avoid the needle. But if we're going to remove all of that deposit, that buildup under your gum, you must be anesthetized for us to get there. Let's talk about pediatric care. I'm getting to the age now where uh, a lot of younger brothers that I've seen coming to the fraternity and a lot of my patients are now becoming fathers and mothers. So pedi pediatric care becomes a concern because with each generation, I often hear patients say, I didn't get the best dental care and I do not want that for my child. So when should your child have that first visit? Really when you see that first tooth. For most children that will be around the age of four months or six months, but some children are actually born with teeth. So as soon as you see those teeth um, pop through the gingiva, it is time for a dental visit. Now, here's the thing. I tell parents, don't expect that your child will have a cleaning as you would when they come in at that age. The whole idea is to take a look, to see that the correct teeth are in, that the correct number are coming in, and that they're coming in in the right location for that age. And it's also to get that child used to seeing someone with a mask, with a white coat, with glasses, what have you, who will be looking in their mouth possibly for the next um, 15 to 18 years of their life. So it is really to get that patient or the child acclimated to what is going on. And if you practice with the child at home, it makes it easier for us. One thing young parents or all parents really should invest in, also found in the toothbrush section, are baby teeth cleaning and wipes. Yes, there are wipes for the teeth. Because you don't want to introduce the infant right off to the toothbrush. Okay? You want to use the wipes and gently wipe away, especially after the baby has their bottle or when they start to move to a, um, softer deposit foods. You want to wipe away all of that debris. Remember, plaque can be wiped away. So wipes are a good uh, gift for your um, line brothers or your family members who have newborns coming. Wipes are a good investment. As the child get a little older, you want to take the child to the mirror and brush with them. Get them used to that bristle being in their mouth. Get them used to someone being in their mouth. And again, continuing their six month checkup with their dentist and dental hygienist so that they get used to someone else being in their mouth. And you can also catch things uh, um, if the child is prone to having caries because of the sugar content that you're having from juices or, or the milk that, that you are providing. We want to be careful of that. But if your child is prone to having um, cavities, we can catch them earlier on. And a pediatric dentist will be um, a great referral for the child. But you want to get them used to someone being in their mouth, used to the fact that there's something going in there to clean. It should become a very common thing for them so that when they get to um, the elementary or primary school age, 
they're able to brush on their own. Now, here's the key, um, young parents or parents in general. After the child brushes, you go back and brush behind them, okay? Because they're not going to always get in those areas and have the techniques that we are talking about tonight. So you should go in behind them and counsel them and tell them, show them a circle of motion and brush behind them so that we can ensure that they are removing all of those soft deposits. So I'll end my, my um, comments here. And I have one of our students from Howard University, uh, Ms. Tamana Finger. She is a third year dental student. Also, she's a registered dental hygienist. She's really great at what she does. And she will do a demonstration for us at this time. So Tamana. Thank you, Dr. Salter. I'm going to be starting first with um, infant care. Um, it is recommended to either just use gauze, you can fold it in forts and just go around the gum. I don't have an infant <laughs> deniform, but you can just go around the gums and wipe, as Dr. Salter mentioned, wiping motion. If you don't have any gauze, um, you can also just take a cloth, usually recommended either a towel or a cotton cloth, so it's more comfortable for the gums. Fold it in forts again, moisten it a little bit, and just go around the gums and wipe all the plaque off that is from the milk or juice or any soft foods that the uh, infant is drinking. Um, it is also recommended to look inside the mouth for any abnormalities that you would see, such as like any sore spots, any white or uh, red lesions that you know you shouldn't be seeing in the mouth. So it's good to also just check inside the baby's mouth to make sure there's nothing growing there that you, it shouldn't be. So that is for infants. The next thing that I'm going to be demonstrating is brushing technique for uh, children, um, six or up. Um, for them, it is recommended to brush horizontally and then circular motion. And you want to get as far back as you can because the six-year-old child is, starting, is going to have their first permanent molars. And those are the first common ones to get the most cavities on because it kind of hides in the back and it grows in without the parent or the child knowing. So it's good to get as far back as you can get to really get this first molar. Um, so you want to go as far back as you can in a circular motion for kids and open this up and go inside and make sure that the child is also brushing this area, which is the common area for plaque or um, calculus to build up. So be sure that they are practicing on brushing 90 degrees, 45 degrees, and 45 degrees, again, around this area, which is crucial. And again, the chewing surfaces for kids as well. For kids, it is recommended that the parents should help brushing at least till they're at age of nine. So even if they're hesitant, but it's good to kind of give them a chance up until the age of nine to make sure that the child is brushing properly. Um, kids is a little bit difficult to start using floss with the string. So for them, it is recommended to use uh, the little tiny floss picks uh, you can get one of those for them to uh, start flossing in between their teeth so that they get used to it as they're becoming an adult. Um, the next thing that I'm going to be demonstrating is uh, patients with orthodontic uh, braces. Um, so for them, I, I again don't have one with the ortho wires, but um, it is recommended that you show them to brush on top of the wire, underneath the wire, and over the wire because that is where most of the plaque starts to build and there's a really high chance of getting uh, decay or caries or cavities in, in between the teeth or any white spots if it is not removed uh, properly. Again, Dr. Salter had showed the picture of the uh, proxa brushes to go in between the teeth for ortho patients. And also this is another uh, device, it's called an interproximal uh, clean. You can use this on top of your electric toothbrush to go in between the teeth to clean the orthodontic um, wires around it. And also you can use this to clean your uh, retainers uh, right around the edges of the retainers. This is really nice to clean around the retainers as well. So this is a really good device. It's by uh, Oral-B. Um, the other um, technique um, is, um, this is called a um, end tuft brush. So this is for patients who have a hard time cleaning in between their gum gum line, uh, I mean, under um, near the gum line, and also the back molars. So this has a curved angle. It is very tiny, tiny head as well to reach in the areas that is hard to 
um, hard to reach with a regular brush. So what you want to do with this is go just right around the gum line, small circular motion to get the plaque because plaque always tends to build up right around the gum line. And then you want to go back behind the back molars. Um, so right around here and just go around it and get the back molars. Because again, this is another area where plaque is usually hides and it's hard to reach because of the size of the toothbrush head. Last but not the least, uh, demonstration for adults. So uh, for adults, what we wanna do is take the brush, either this or the electric one. Again, it doesn't matter which one you use as long as you're doing the proper technique, which is usually the proper angle. So you want to go around the gum line, 45 degree angle, uh, it's a little hard to show, 45 degree angle, and you want to do small, short stroke motions. Very, very small, short stroke motions right around the gum line, 45 degree angle. And you want to go all the way far back, as far back as you can reach. Now, um, the best way to reach the back teeth on the uppers is to close your jaw a little bit. When you close your jaw, your cheek muscles get stretchy and relaxed, and it gives you more room for the brush to fit as far back as you can. So that is a good technique that I learned from school um, to kind of close a jaw to really get behind those second and third molars. Um, after you're done with the front side, you want to do the chewing surfaces. That would be just go on top of the chewing surfaces. And then the back palate area, you want to do the same thing, 45 degree angle into the gum line. And then the key to brush the front area is you want to brush 45 degrees in and out this time. And then 90 degrees in and out this time. And then 45 degrees again. So it's 45 degrees, 90 degrees on the front teeth and 45 degrees. Then you want to finish with 45 degrees again, all the way to the back right over here. The bottom is the same exact angle. You want to do 45 degrees, go around the gum line, 45 degrees everywhere. Then the chewing surfaces, chewing surfaces, chewing surfaces. And then the inside where the tongue usually sits, you want to do 45 degrees on the back teeth. And then the front, this is really important here to do the proper technique so you don't have that heavy buildup. You want to do 45 degrees in and out this time, and then 90 degrees, and then 45 degrees. When you do the 90, 45, uh, 45, 90, 45 degrees, it, the bristles actually touch the tooth instead of doing this. Most patients do this angle. So if you do that, you can see the gap where the bristles aren't really touching. So you want to do 45, 90, 45, and then get back to the 45 degree angle again to finish. Last but not the least, you always want to brush your tongue or scrape it with a tongue scraper. You can buy tongue scrapers from the grocery store as well, they have it. If you don't have one, you can also use a plastic spoon. They work great. Um, the other thing that I was gonna show is just an electric toothbrush. The angling is the exact same thing right there. Uh, most electric toothbrushes are timed for two minutes. It is recommended that you brush the right upper 30 seconds, upper left 30 seconds, lower right 30 seconds, and lower left 30 seconds. So about two minutes to brush the entire mouth. Um, the best flossing technique is the string floss. This is kind of the amount you need. It's a little tough for me to show the flossing, but um, you want to go all the way to where the gum and the papilla is. So around right here of the gum. You want to put the floss all the way through, make a C shape on one side, and then go on the opposite side, make another C shape to get through all the way to the gum line. Most people, what they do is they go up and down, up and down, up and down, which is not as effective. So you wanna go really around the gums, move it around, and then take out the floss. Um, again, as Dr. Salter mentioned, for patients with dexterity issues, electric toothbrush works the best. And um, with dexterity issues, you can use a water pick, which is a water flosser, or floss picks um, to help with flossing for adults. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our panelists for the very, this very, very informative discussion. To our guest, we hope that you have gained one or two tidbits that will help you to better oral health. 
and that means to better total health. We have about five minutes for questions. Uh, we had intended for our panelists to do a one minute wrap up, but with the time being as it is, we're gonna stick with uh, uh, just going now to questions and uh, at this point in time, I only see one question in the comment section, and that is what type toothbrush should you use, soft or medium? And I think Brother Salter addressed that issue. So would, just, would you just repeat that, Brother Salter? Absolutely. You want to use soft bristles. Soft bristles, that's what you need. Okay. And now we have talked about the oral cavity with teeth, but we all know that at some point in time, uh, we've seen patients without teeth and these patients have dentures. So the question that I'd like to propose to, to the panel is, for those patients with dentures, how do they maintain good oral health? What can they do to maintain good oral health? I'm going to send that to Brother Anderson. Brother Aunt Jay, you got your hand up there. So patients who wear dentures um, should take their dentures out at night for a couple of reasons. One, to um, allow the blood to circulate. Um, two, um, to clean the dentures. And um, three, um, because of the medications we take um, when we're older, we can get fungal infections. And these fungal infections, if your denture is in all, all night, um, they can get worse and cause um, infections that can spread to the rest of your body and also make wearing your dentures uh, very difficult. So uh, always take the dentures out at night, allow your gums to rest, clean with, I use, I tell my patients to use Listerine um, nightly and, and to use poly um, effort dinner or something like that uh, once a week. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thanks, son. If, if I may add a few things. Um, sure, sure Ryle. Uh, one of the things with dentures, as, uh, you, as we just told, you never sleep in dentures. The reason is if you leave, particularly the upper denture, if you leave that denture in 24 hours a day, you tend to develop a condition called papillary hyperplasia, which we believe is a precursor possibly to oral cancer. I recommend to patients um, take the dentures out, brush them as you would normal teeth. I think there's denture cream and other things you can use. And a cheap way of keeping uh, your dentures tasting nice is soak them in, at night in baking soda and water. You can buy the more expensive things, but baking soda and water works just as well. Now, if your dentures get stained because you smoke or you have coffee, a good thing to clean them up is uh, make a, a concoction of equal parts of water, uh, uh, um, baking soda, and, and, and Clorox. But you, you got to be very careful with the Clorox because it will bleach the dentures. But if you make, make equal portions of baking soda, water, and Clorox, and soak it maybe two or three nights in a row, the plastic comes back and it's almost brand new. And so I recommend that for those people who have stained the dentures. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Bell. Now, this is a question that I'd like to pose to, since we've talked about oral health and the relationship with systemic health, uh, I'd like to ask the question, is there training in place between medical education and dental education that integrates this relationship among physicians and dentists? Is there some integration in there from the curricula of the two two disciplines to bring this to 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 some degree of uh, of recognition and treatment. Uh, Brother Smith, I'll take that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'd like to share that. Yes, I think a number of the academic institutions actually recognize the value of collaboration, and so there's a term called interprofessional collaboration that's actually occurring in a number of the schools. In essence, it's a team approach to addressing healthcare. They realize that by working with other uh, professionals, you get a different perspective of treating that patient, but it also improves the quality of care for the patient, the family, um, the caregiver, as well as the local community. So we're seeing more and more uh, academic institutions embrace what's called uh, interprofessional collaboration. We also see a number of academic institutions who have established boards. 
Um, they are working with thought leaders across the country to learn more about this relationship that exists uh, between all health and systemic health. And so um, that's another initiative that's being pushed as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Brother Allen, for that, those comments and for clearing, uh, addressing that issue for us. There is a question in the comment section, and it says, is there a recommended type of mouthwash, alcohol-based or non-alcohol-based? Who would like to take that one? Brother Anderson. I usually recommend non-alcoholic based mouthwashes. Uh, I personally use Listerine Total. It's the one in the pur purple bottle. The reason why I recommend non-alcoholic uh, mouthwashes is that um, the alcohol can have a negative benefit on your gums. Um, alcohol tends to dry your mouth. The non-alcoholic type, um, many of the ones on the market are antimicrobial. So uh, you do get um, the uh, killing of the germs that can cause bad breath um, and reduce tooth decay. Some things you may want to add into your mouthwash um, is, uh, again, uh, I have focus on on um on on fluoride so if you can get a mouthwash that also contains fluoride for all people um there is a benefit okay well thank you thank you brother anderson that pretty much sums up our time for questions uh this evening and i would just like to thank the the panel again for working to put this together and for sharing your information with us I would also like to thank those of you who have attended, and uh, I appreciate the comments that you have made back uh, regarding this presentation. They're exceptional, and uh, and they're a, a good uh, uh, thank you to the panelists for what they have presented tonight. I would like to remind you and announce that next week, uh, the Surgeon Journal's initiative topic will be breast cancer. That's next Thursday at the, the 28th at 7 p.m. And so with this, I say good evening to all. We hope that you have enjoyed this and that you will take some of these ideas if you could take just two tidbits away. And remember, as Brother Anderson said, floss all of those that you wish to keep. And I say, be true to your teeth so they will not be false to you. Thank you very much and good night. <laughs>